Well, first of all, I want to thank Darius and Linda so much for having me here. And after coming here and hearing all the inspiring stories and looking forward to hearing more, I'm just, I'm so emotional right now <laughs> from hearing everybody else's stories. And it's amazing to be a part of such a wonderful event with so many great stories. And um, so thank you for having me here. Uh, it's quite different from what I'm used to. The conferences that the conferences I attend are more serious, and you know everybody goes to their room at the end of the day, <laughs> and nobody really interacts. And like Linda said, it's very human interaction is very important. And um, so I'm going to tell you my story, and I'm gonna take a seat here. Um, anyone who escapes from a war-torn country, they all have stories. And um, so uh, just like them, you know, our family also has a story. And when I was in Afghanistan, I was five and I was playing in the playground with my cousin. And uh, we saw a rocket fly over our head. We could usually, uh, you know, figure out the sound. We were already familiar with the sound of a rocket. So as soon as we heard one, we're like, uh-oh. And at that point in time, being five years old, knowing what might happen if a rocket hits, um, it's pretty sad. But at that time, I thought that the whole world was this way. I thought that, you know, I could die today, I could die tomorrow. I'm not really sure, you know, death to me was just something uh, normal because that's all we saw. And um, so I had no idea that there were countries where kids were actually playing in the playground and they didn't have to fear a rocket flying over their heads, like countries like you know, Canada, where I ended up. And so um, my family escaped. Uh, and uh, we ended up um, in the back of a truck with five other families. And I'm not talking normal truck. I'm talking about a truck with just four wooden walls that were barely holding on and going through mountains for three days and three nights and my mom carrying my six month old brother in her arms and you know just doing everything she could to try to be there for us as much as she could in the back of a old truck like that so um at that time i also knew that you know we might not make it through the border <coughs> so we're trying to make it to pakistan eventually we got there um and we were lucky and then you know we stayed in Pakistan for a while as refugees. And um, finally, we were uh, very lucky to end up in Canada. And my dad, I asked my dad recently, I said, why did you choose Canada? Because, you know, with, with his level of education and um, uh, he, he did, uh, he was able to choose from countries like Australia, United States, um, anywhere in Europe and Canada. And he said, I chose Canada because I feel like it's a country where my kids can actually um, grow up and have the opportunities. And it's also very peaceful. And um, so I grew up there, and I started taking an interest in um, what was going on back home in Afghanistan because I always felt like I could have been one of those girls living there. Uh, if we hadn't escaped, I would have been in their shoes. And so I always put myself in their situation and their shoes. And um, as my interest grew, as I grew, my interest grew. Um, and so I started paying attention to the news. And I started doing my own research, finding out what's really going on in Afghanistan. And during the rule of the Taliban, it was probably the worst place. It actually was the worst place for a woman to live in. And uh, over 90% of the people in Afghanistan were and might still be illiterate. Um, and women were, the, the soccer stadium turned into an execution place, uh, where they would, you know, stone women to death, uh, for simple things like adultery. Um, and this was very painful to watch because the world was doing nothing. And the world continued to do nothing, even though, you know, there were some leaders that were begging for help, uh, until 2001 happened. So... At that time, it was just painful to see what was happening to my country and what was happening to the women and the children of this country and no one doing anything about it. And I said, well, what can I do? And so I thought, I'm going to be a lawyer 
and I'm going to use law to go back there one day and, you know, try to change things. And I was naive. I was young. I didn't know. I, I had, you know, I was dreaming and things like that. But it's good to dream because, you know, dreaming is what got me to where I am today. So, and a lot of people were like, oh, Majda, stop the dreaming. You're one person. What can you do? And uh, I, I just continued because that's my nature. That's what I do. And so um, I went to school and I realized, and my parents always reminded me, they're like, you have these opportunities that, you know, most people don't have. And why don't you do something about it? You know, use the opportunities that Canada gives you to give back to, to a country that needs it. And I thought I thought that's a perfect idea. Why not? So, um, I mean, I was I was a bookworm. I was a complete nerd. I didn't know anything about music at all. It never clicked. It never crossed my mind. Um, I used to write poetry, but I didn't know um, I didn't even know how to tune a radio. And so, you know, I in grade seven, um, when kids were talking about music and. S uh, who their favorite singer is and what their favorite song is on the radio. I was like, oh, well, um, I can make friends this way. Maybe if I start listening to the radio and forcing myself to like music and memorize, you know, who's I, I would sit, uh, I went home one day and I said, uh, mom, how do you tune a radio? And she taught me. <laughs> and so I started listening to the, um, the songs and trying to memorize, like forcing myself to memorize the name of the song and the actual singer. And so the next day to try to fit in and make some friends, I go, hey, did you guys hear that song, you know, by this singer? And I, I probably messed it up and they're <laughs> like, <laughs> but at least I, I started a conversation. So um, that's how out of tune I was with music. <laughs> and so when I was um, in high school and I was writing poetry, um, my mom said, well, you need an extracurricular activity. And I said, well, what do you want me to do? And she's like, well, I don't know, ballroom dancing, figure skating, you got to do something. And I said, well, I'm not girly enough for any of those things, so what do I do? And she's like, uh, she goes, well, why don't you just take guitar lessons? I said, sure, that sounds good, you know, just to get her off my back. <laughs> and um, I, she sent me to her friend, and I was very shy and very scared, so she ends up... Uh, and when I went to her her friend's place, I'm expecting him to, you know, hand me a guitar and he goes, Well, sing. And I go, What? I I didn't come here to sing. But I was so shy and scared I couldn't say anything. So I just, you know, made a sound and I was like, Oh, that's horrible. Like <laughs> I scared myself. But um <laughs> and so um he he tells me, Oh, you have potential. Like, did you not just hear that? And He's like, your mom's my friend, you know, I, I wouldn't uh, waste your time or money or anything, so I'm telling you the truth. You do have potential if you work hard enough, you'll actually get there. So, I mean, I did this to try to get my mom off my back, but at the same time, it kind of clicked because I was like, wait a minute, what is the best thing? If I'm, if I'm forced to take vocal lessons, I might as well do something with this too. So, you know, it was like a light bulb went on and I said, people listen to lyrics of of songs more than they would listen to a presidential speech. And if I become a lawyer, or even if I get into politics, it'll take me years before somebody actually really listens to what I have to say. But if I write a very catchy song with the appropriate lyrics that I want to get across to people as a message, I said, this is perfect. So that's when I became 100% determined and dedicated to this um, dream of mine. And so I started, um, I pretty much did three years of vocal lessons till I was almost ready vocally. <laughs> and then I, um, I had my, my first song out and I asked my dad, who is a poet, to write it. And he wrote a very patriotic and very um, fun song, very catchy and patriotic. So I said, okay, well, this got the attention of people. Um, a couple months later, um, there was an acid attack on a few girls who were going home from school uh, in Kandahar City. And this was 2008. And my dad at the time was working with the Canadian forces in Kandahar. And he was so pained by what had happened um, that girls were now too scared to attend school because, you know, that that was the goal of the Taliban to try to scare them off from getting an education. 
he came home and he had this really sad look in his eyes and he said, I wrote this on the plane. Uh, he handed me the lyrics and he said, I hope you can do something with this. And when I read the lyrics, I teared up and I was like, this is so powerful. It's so politically driven, but so appropriate for the time and not aggressive, but it kind of reminds everybody what women have done and has mentioned all the names or some of the names that of, of women who have made history in Afghanistan um, throughout the centuries and years. And there was a lady he mentioned who was almost, well, similar to the Joan of Arc. And there were poets and teachers. And, you know, these ladies have schools named after them. And they have streets named after them and um, even towns. So I was like, these are amazing women. And I started doing my research on them and found out that there were so many women in the history of Afghanistan who just did amazing things. And he had compared them to the be beautiful things. and. Instantly, the composition of the song, I, I just started singing it. I, there were just lyrics, and they turned into a song. And I was like, this is amazing. I guess it, it just it was meant to be. And um, so that's, that's the song that uh, got the attention of a lot of uh, political figures in Afghanistan. And I was invited to the Embassy of Afghanistan in Washington, D.C. to perform this. And um, at the time, you know, I ran into a couple of people. I didn't know who they were. And... Uh, they ended up working at the White House uh, alongside the president. So, you know, I was uh, privileged enough to uh, be invited to the White House and perform for uh, President Barack Obama as well with his guests and the First Lady. And um, they asked me to sing that song on International Women's Day. And at the same time, I got an offer uh, in Afghanistan to do, to do a show. I was supposed to do um, host the show Afghanistan's Got Talent. So I said, sure, why not? You know, I just finished uh, journalism, and so this is perfect. And when I went there, my, my mother, of course, went there with me after um, hesitating and not letting me go to Afghanistan. She finally agreed after two months of me begging her. And so she said, um, she said to the producers, she goes, if my daughter is away from her um, friends and family and, you know, from her safety and... and uh, you know her her country where she grew up then and, and she's going to be here then she we want to do something that's worth our while and everybody else's so she said have you heard of oprah and they go what's oprah and <laughs> so my mom she tried to explain to them what who oprah was and how powerful she was and how much she's she's helped the people around the world and surprisingly i walked into a a corner store and out of all the DVDs that were, you know, everything from every country, I see like a full um, set of the Oprah Show DVDs sitting right in front of me. And I'm like, I can't believe I'm seeing this collection of Oprah DVDs in Afghanistan, you know, in this little corner store. And it was the only collection there. And so everything kind of, you know, worked out the way it was supposed to. And it was amazing. Looking back now, I was just like, you know, everything that happened step by step to get everything going. And so I handed this DVD to um, to the producer and director, and they loved it. They just completely put this show, Afghanistan's Got Talent, on the side, and they made the Mujda show. And we started working on, you know, the concept and how it was going to be similar to the Oprah show. So they found me a Dr. Phil. <laughs> and... <laughs> and... Um, we would discuss everything, you know, before we went on stage, and uh, we would make sure that, you know, this conversation was going to go in the right direction. Um, and of course, I would, uh, I would be the Oprah and just, you know, ask him the questions and wait for his answers. And we started off talking about child abuse because over 90% of children in Afghanistan get abused, uh, either emotionally, physically, mentally. Um, it was a topic that, and, and I took a lot of advice from my parents and my, uh, you know, family over there. And so they gave me all the information I needed, um, along with some other people. And uh, so we started off talking, speaking about uh, children and, you know, um, vi uh, 
uh, child abuse and things like that and how it affects you know children growing up and what are better ways to actually um, deal with children rather than um, uh, ab abuse and so we moved forward from that slowly into um, speaking about women and um, speaking about domestic violence and my parents had told me to be very careful with this topic and make sure that I start off getting into the hearts of people before I start you know speaking about these situations because um, it, it would affect my show and it would probably either stop my show from happening or um, it would stop it halfway so I wouldn't reach my goal. So he said, you have to get into the hearts of people. You have to speak about you know, children, move on, and don't go right into women's rights because you're going to look aggressive. So I said, okay. Um, we started talking about domestic violence, relationships between men and women, husband and wife, and how that affects the kids and how that affects themselves and their daily lives and their futures and their kids' futures. Um, and then I s and then I started talking about there was one topic that was divorce and everybody said, oh now you're pushing it because divorce is not a subject to speak about in public not even you know within households this is a taboo subject it's not supposed to be spoken about um, especially in public and I said I have to do this and my uncle called me he goes you're making a mistake you should not push it to that point you are your show is already very um you know it's it's um already going outside of the limits of what you can talk about and so um i said well this is what i'm here for i'm going to push it as much as i can and right after my topic about divorce and Divorce over there, I was they, they thought that I was promoting divorce, and yet in my show I specifically said, you know, a lot of Afghan people over there with 30 years of war, going through um, 30 years of war, uh, a lot of people have lost, um, I guess they're, you know, it was completely civilized before, and during that time something has happened where they're, they're lacking a lot of those common sense and a lot of these things. So um, I I talked about divorce and I said, you know, a lot of a lot of Afghans worry about what other people think about them and their family, and they don't pay attention to what their kids are w going through. And there there's uh, women and girls who are burning themselves to death, and that's their only form of uh, you know suicide, and they, they're only a way out. So. I said, um, wouldn't it be better to start paying attention to your own children and to your own uh, daughters and just, you know, let them have the divorce, let them be separated, and um, instead of going through that, there was one girl who uh, burned herself twice and she failed, um, and she was in the hospital, and they asked her, you know, what would you different, what would you do differently next time? And her answer was, next time I would try to find a gun. And so it was very disturbing when I came across these stories. And um, that's why I said I had to do something. But unfortunately, right after um, the divorce topic, just a few days later, uh, I was visiting my family. And there was a rumor that I had been killed, that they had cut off my nose and my ears and had severed my head and used me as an example, you know, to show other women not this is what would happen to you if, if you continue to do this. And um, so I get uh, from the TV station, um, the, the president of the TV station sent me an urgent email. He said, where are you? And he was panicking. And I said, I'm at home in Vancouver. I'm still here. And he goes, well, there's a horrible rumor right now. And my dad called at the same time. And my mom walked into my room and said, have you heard that there's something going on in Afghanistan? There's a rumor, a very horrible one. <coughs> I was used to rumors, but not this severe. And so I said, that's OK, mom. It's just a rumor, no big deal. So I'm on my way back um, two days later, and I switched my SIM card. And all of a sudden, I have all these messages from the Canadian embassy. And I said, it's urgent. Please contact us before you come back to Afghanistan. And so I called, and they go, where are you? I said, I'm in, I'm in London right now on my way back. And he goes, 
could you please turn around and head back to Vancouver? It's not safe for you to come back right now. And I said, oh, you mean the rumors? They're just, they're just rumors. You know, this happens to me all the time. There's always threats. There's always rumors. This is what I have to face. And they said, no, our intelligence believes that you're under direct threat and that you have to leave. It's not a rumor. And um, I said, I, at that time, I started panicking. I said, I have my whole life uh, there now. I have my house, my cats, my you know, my friends and my show and everything that I've built for, for years. And um, how, do, how can you expect me to just drop all that and fly back to Vancouver? And they said, well, you know, we did give you a warning. We can't do more than this, but we hope that you do the right thing. And so I did go back to Afghanistan. And I took precaution, but uh, the last few days uh, became pretty difficult because I, I was getting phone calls from government officials asking me to leave. I was getting phone calls from the chief of police of Kabul. Um, everybody, including my, the companies that I worked for at the TV station, they said, uh, no amount of security will protect you at this point. You must leave. And so my parents flew in, and uh, I, I went into hiding for two days at my uncle's house before I left uh, while, I was, uh, while some other people were packing my things. And it was a horrible time. I came back. I felt defeated, and this was you know, the second time that I was forced out of the country. Um, so it hurt really bad. And I came here, I had a very, very difficult time. Um, I didn't know what to do. I felt completely uh, defeated and helpless. And something that I was so hopeful for had just completely vanished, just like that. And so I came here, and it took me a while to get over what had happened. And to start, you know, realizing that yes, I can make another. Maybe I can make another set of goals. And just like I achieved all those things, maybe I can do it again. And um, so now I've started working with uh, some some people to to get to a point where uh, I can have my show fr from here, and I can produce my own show. And I can speak about the topics. I can find another Dr. Phil, and you know, maybe have it aired, he have it filmed here, and send it over. And uh, if I can't be in the country physically, I can do it that way, or I can go back and um, do a couple of shows, you know, pre-record a couple of shows and come back. And so these are all the options that I I found. And then my mom goes, well, you know, if they if they did this to you and they forced you out of the country and you do feel defeated, why don't you? do it in a much bigger way. And I go, what do you mean? And she goes, well, you know, if you get yourself out um, out there in North America, you'll have a much bigger voice. And so I said, well, that's a really good idea, you know? And, and I do thank my parents because they always give me that extra push, you know, to, to get to the next level. And um, it has been proven to me that dreams, you, you could make dreams into reality. And I am a big dreamer, and um, and the things that I did dream about, the things that my mom dreamed about, they all came true, and so much more happened. I mean, I was expecting to do a, have my show um, maybe ten years from when I started my music career, but it happened within within two three years. So you never know what happens, and so now I'm uh, I just got an agent, and I'm like I'll do exactly what I need to do, and if it takes me another five years to get back on my feet and do it in a much much stronger way, and get my my voice heard across the world, and maybe not just help Afghanistan, but uh, those countries uh, where women are being oppressed and children are not being treated well, and places where they need help. Um, I want to do that in a much bigger way now and help not just Afghanistan, but any country that. Uh, needs it, and I'm thankful to those who have actually supported me and believed in me. And um, so that is uh, my goal for the future, and that's what I'm working on currently. And so hopefully one day I can come here and tell you a story of how that's going. <laughs> um, <coughs> so that's it for my story, and I thank you all so much for listening. Uh, now I'm going to sing you a song. I'm not sure if you want to hear a song, uh, the song that my, my dad wrote for me. Uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
so normally I'm used to, you know, big big stages and uh, lots of people, but this is such a warm environment and it's a little bit more nerve wracking than, than what I'm used to as well. <laughs> it's good. Oh yes, yeah. I I can. Um, should I should I play some? Do we have time or? Yes, I'll 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 do a little bit of um. Well, I'll do a little bit of a a cappella of the song that my dad wrote me, and it it just says I'm a girl. I'm an Afghan girl. Please don't break my wings. Please don't break my honor. And it just mentions all the women who have done amazing things, uh, in the history of Afghanistan. So um, here goes. And I have to sing it a cappella because um, it's just a nice, warm, friendly environment. I'm sure you guys are okay with that. Mashikan polo param ro mashikan Mashikan toji saram ro mashikan Astamozo da chuo hu bataman Astamozo da chuo hu bataman Ishktoram chumalo lai bawatan Sardi ham nagma chubul bul bachaman Zainabu knows o mehiri pasohan. Zainabu knows o mehiri pasohan. Doctor Am, Doctor Evron Amman, Doctor E. Mulke de Leron Amman. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. Thank you again, Darius, for having me here.